Oh, hi. Welcome. Come in. Come in. Thank you for joining me for um, part one of my talk, which is promoting circular orderability to left orderability. So this first talk um, is all about connections between... So the, the, the result I want to talk about is um, connections between circular orderability and left orderability of groups. Uh, so this first talk is just going to be sort of a background in what left orderable and circular orderly orderable groups are. Uh, the result I want to talk about is joined with Jason Bell and Adam Clay, so let's get that out of the way here, although I doubt I'll state very many, if any, results in this part, in this lecture. Uh, so before we begin, just please excuse the bloodshot eyes. Um, it's the perfect combination of seasonal allergies and having a two-week-old. I would not recommend that combination. <laughs> okay, here we go. So let's just get stuck in. So as any solid math talk starts off with, let's talk about the definition of a left orderable group. Right, so group G is left orderable. Right, so um, which we're going to denote LO for short. Uh, if there exists, if there exists a total order, uh, this on G, such that um, it's invariant by left multiplication. Right? That's what a left orderable group is. For all H, G1, G2, and G. And let's use the technology we have at our disposal. Great. Okay, brilliant. Um, but this is not, I mean, what's what's the intuition here? The intuition is that you can place your, um, the intuition is that you can place your group elements on the line. So there's my group G, right? In such a way, let's get this guys, let's get this blue guys here. In such a way that if G1 is to the left of G2, then when you multiply on the left by H, H of G1 is still to the left of H of G2. G1 is still to the left of H of G2. Okay, nothing to it. Like, can you can you put your group elements in a line so that the group operation respects the order in which they put in a line? That's what a left orderable group is. So I mean, we'll go over some examples in a moment, but the, your favorite one is the one I drew, which is the real numbers under addition, okay? or, or the integers or the rational numbers. These are your standard sort of left orderable groups. But of course, we can have much more interesting ones, which we'll get to. Um, so equivalent to the definition I gave of having a left invariant order, uh, so just a background, so equivalently, equivalently, uh, sorry, equivalent to the, equivalent to the existence of a total order, terms of a left ordering, On G, on G is the existence of a positive cone. Right? So what's a positive cone? A positive cone is a subset. Um, it's a subset of your group which imitates being the positive part, all the things bigger than the identity, or if you think it are real numbers, all the positive real numbers. Right. So positive cone, which is a subset that satisfies the following conditions, um, which is that G is equal to the disjoint union of all the inverses, along with the identity, along with all the positive guys. And if you take two elements in a positive cone and multiply them together, you remain in the positive cone. Okay, so this is for all. Oh, no, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Great. Cool. All right, so it's an exercise. I mean, it's not too hard to show. Once you know that the positive cone is trying to imitate all the, is trying to capture the notion of being positive, which means you're greater than the identity, it's easy to go back and forth. And I'll leave that as an exercise to you to show that it's actually an equivalent definition. Uh, the existence of a positive cone is equivalent to the existence of a uh, left ordering or a total left invariant order on the group. 
Okay, so that's what a left orderable group is. We'll do some examples in a moment, but before that, I need I want to talk about the uh, the definition of a circularly orderable group, and we'll start with the um, intuition, right? A left orderable group is a group you can put on a line. A circularly orderable group is a group you can put on a circle. Great, right? A group you can put on a circle so that the order in which elements appear around the circle is preserved by left multiplication, right? And what do we mean by that? What do we mean by the order around the circle in which elements appear? Is that if I have, well, let's do this. If I have um, three, for any triple of elements, distinct elements, G1, G2, G3, let's say, if I multiply on the left by H, the order in which they go around the circle, like clockwise or counterclockwise, doesn't change, right? So maybe now this is H of G3, this is h g1 and this is h times g2 right so if i go g1 g2 g3 it's still counterclockwise okay so this is the intuition for what a circularly orderable group is it's can you put it on a circle can you put your group elements on a circle so that left multiplication preserves the order in which they put around the circle how do you um formalize that well here's how you do it let me tell you okay so definition, right, so G is circularly orderable or for short CO. All right, so if um, there exists a function C from our group to minus one, zero, one, all right, the set minus one, zero, one with the following properties, all right? So the first one is that if any two, so right, so g, g cubed, so C eats triplets, and it has to imitate saying, well, if you feed me a triple that goes counterclockwise, well, I want to determine whether or not the triple goes counterclockwise or clockwise. Well, the first thing is that if you feed me a triple where two of the elements are, sa are the same, I'm going to return zero. That's the first thing. Like, get rid of that degenerate case. So the first property is that the pre-image of zero is exactly all the triples G1, G2, G3, and G cubed, uh, such that I'm just going to write not all three are distinct. Not all three are distinct. Okay, so this is sort of the gen degenerate um, situation. Let me get my face out of the way. Okay, such that not all three are distinct. Okay. Great. So th those are all the things that get sent to zero. Um, whether or not you're, you go clockwise or counterclockwise, let me leave that picture up there. Whether or not you go clockwise or counterclockwise is preserved under left multiplication. So G1, G2, G3 is equal to C of H, G1, H, G2, H, G3. They're all H, G1, G2, G3 in our group. Okay. And the last condition is something which captures the notion of going around a circle. And it's going to seem like it's not clear where that comes from, but it turns out to be the right, the right way to go about things. Okay, so um, here's the, exactly the notion. So you take a deep breath and you make sure that you get all your signs right. It doesn't really matter for this talk exactly what I'm writing down here. What does matter is that there is some condition like this, right, which takes four points around your circle and says the relationship between these three being clockwise or counterclockwise has something to do with the relationship with these three being clockwise or counterclockwise, which has something to do with the relationship with these three being counterclockwise. And when you put this condition in, it exactly captures what you want in terms of things going around the circle, right? So Intuitively, if you're going back and forth between the picture I drew at the top and this definition, um, C returns 1 if the tuple G1, G2, G3 goes counterclockwise around the circle. It returns minus 1 if it goes clockwise around the circle, and it returns 0 if two of them coincide. Okay, so that's that's the definition of a um, circular ordering of a group. And a group is circularly orderable if there exists a circular ordering. Right. 
Um, those of you who have seen some group cohomology before will notice that the second two, um, the second two properties, sorry, let me get my face out of the way again. The second two properties um, are the definition of being a homogeneous two cocycle. Right? This um, probably won't come up in this talk, but it'll come up in the second talk about being a cocycle and why that's important. So a circular ordering is actually just a cocycle um, with some added conditions. Okay, great. So let's have a look at some examples. All right, so um, examples of both left orderable and circularly orderable groups. So left orderable groups, um, well, let's start with the ones that you'd hope are actually examples, otherwise you've probably made a bad decision. So for left orderable groups, um, the integers, the rationals, the reals, these are all left orderable groups. Right? There, is, there are two left orderings you can put on the integers. There are two left orderings you can put on the rationals. There are uncountably le many left orderings you can put on the reals. The group Z cross Z. Um, this is a left orderable group. Uh, and one way you could order this is sort of lexicographically, kind of like how you would a dictionary. Right? Um, so you should think about that and see if you can show that that's a left ordering. Um, and in fact, as an exercise to get your hand dirty is um, to show that there are uncountably many left orderings on Z cross Z. And the way you want to go about doing this is to show there are uncountably many possible positive cones. Right, so try and think about what a positive cone would look like in Z cross Z. Remember, it's just you can think of Z cross Z as a, all the integer points in R2. And think about how you'd construct a positive cone that way. All right, so some more interesting examples. If you look at the orientation preserving homeomorphisms of the real line, this is a left orderable group. Um, how do you see it's left orderable? Pick a countable dense subset. My favorite is the rationals of the reals. Uh, any homeomorphism is determined by what it does on those. So enumerate the, the rational numbers. And then if you're comparing two homeomorphisms, just compare them based on the first rational number in your enumeration that they differ on. And then that'll give you left ordering. So as you can imagine, there are a lot of choices there. Um, so there's a lot of left orderings you can put on. Um, more... Uh, I guess more, more examples. The free group is left orderable. Um, we'll see that pi 1 of some 3 manifolds are left orderable for some m3. And this is sort of more in line with the L-space conjecture stuff. Um, the braid group, bn, which is the braid group. This is left orderable. Um, and mapping class groups, when you have non-empty boundary, are left orderable. All right, so if you know what mapping class groups are, great. If you don't, don't worry about it. Um, it'll come up a little later uh, in the second talk, but right now, don't worry too much about it. Okay, so those are just some examples of left orderable groups. What about some examples of circularly orderable groups? Well, um, in the same vein over here on the left where we said the, um, the integers, the rationals, the reals, these are your archetypal left orderable groups, right? Well. Similarly, if these groups are not circularly orderable, you've made the wrong definition, right? When you teach modular arithmetic, you you say, here are the integers mod k, and you draw them on a clock. That's your circular ordering. Um, Q mod z, again, the group S1. These are all circularly orderable groups. Um, some ones that are super important in terms of the L-space conjecture. Homeo plus S1 and PSL2R. So I'm sure these will make appearances in some of the other talks. Um, some three manifold groups that are not left orderable are circularly orderable. Some M3. And again, I have to mention mapping class groups wherever I can. So if you take a mapping class group of a closed surface marked at one point, so they have to fix that point. So what, I mean, I may as well say what the mapping class group is. It's a, it's a group of orientation preserving homeomorphisms of a surface up to isotopy. Your surface is typically orientable. Um, and 
here we're going to take our surface to make to have one puncture or one marked point which has to be preserved by all the homeomorphisms. So this is a circularly orderable group. Okay, great. So at this point, um, your if you've tagged along this far, great, excellent. But there should be a very natural question in your head, which is the following, right? Who cares? Who cares? Why do I tell you about this stuff? Well, I mean, hopefully, if you're if you're attending talks virtually, if you're binge watching YouTube videos, um, you're uh, about the L-space conjecture. You have a f you have a fair appreciation about that. Left orderable groups are important in terms of low-dimensional topology, but I'm going to maybe give you some other reasons to believe. Um, so here's the first one, which I think is a really cool fact, um, is that if G is countable, suppose G is countable, here are some equivalent definitions, equivalent um, conditions of being left orderable and circularly orderable. Then G is left orderable if and only if G embeds into homeo plus R. And G is circularly orderable, again, if and only if G embeds into homeo plus S1. Now, why would I care about this? Well, this exactly, these, these are combinatorial conditions, left orderability and circularly orderable, or circular orderability. These are combinatorial conditions, right? They're just sort of algebraic. You can't, there's no reason there should be much geometry going on with these guys. But however, they exactly characterize all the groups all the countable groups anyway that act on one manifolds, right? Act orientation preservingly on one manifolds. I think that's neat. All one manifolds are either intervals, at least without boundary, they're open intervals or circles. So uh, yeah, this is all the groups which act on these guys by orientation preserving homeomorphisms. I think that's that's something that's undersold and it's good enough reason to study these groups by themselves. And of course, the L space conjecture. That's why you should care about left orderable groups at least. But we'll see that thinking about left orderable groups without circularly orderable groups is kind of um, disadvantageous. You want to, you really want to think about this. Okay, so here are some fun facts about left and circularly orderable groups. Fun facts. Okay, so the first one, again, this is, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to go through some of the basic properties of circularly orderable and left orderable groups. First one, subgroups of LO and CO groups are, of course, LO and CO, respectively. All right, so subgroup of a left orderable group is left orderable. You just restrict any left ordering from the big group to a small group, and it's a left ordering in a small group. Same with circular orderability. Right, there's nothing to it. Um, if you're left orderable, it implies that you're torsion free. So this is a fun little exercise. Um, if you're circularly orderable, it turns out that you can have some torsion, but the torsion is pretty restricted. There's a certain type of torsion you can have. Um, and the way I'm going to write this is that all finite subgroups are cyclic. Okay. But really what the theorem here is, is that what the result is, is that all finite circularly orderable groups are cyclic. Okay. Again, this is a fun exercise. They're both fun exercises, at least for some definition of fun. Uh, go ahead. Go on. You know you want to... Uh, here's another fun fact, is that left orderable, if you're left orderable, then you're circularly orderable. And here's why. So let's draw those pictures of, um, right, here's your left orderable group. It looks like a line. Let's say that's where the identity is. Here's your left orderable group. Here's your left orderable group as a circularly orderable group. Okay, put it on a circle, and it turns out because it's left orderable, the order in which things go around the circle is preserved. 
right? More formally, right, why is this true? How do I show that left orderable implies circularly orderable? Um, is I, I declare C of G1, G2, G3 to be equal to 1 when G1, G, G1 is less than or equal, is strictly less than, oh boy, oh boy. G1 is strictly less than G2, G2 is strictly less than G3. Okay, so that's formally how you'd write it down, but all left orderable groups are circularly orderable. In terms of that countability result I had before, if you act on the real line, you act on the circle, fixing one point. That's the idea anyway. Cool. All left audible groups are circularly audible. Let's keep going. And so what other group theory, group theoretic properties are interesting about these guys? Right, did I warn you it was very algebraic talk? Anyway, it's very algebraic talk. It's just algebra. Okay. Cool, 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 cool. cool. Right. So, okay. So what, what are the fun facts we have after that awkward pause? All right, so let's assume that you have a extension of an extension of groups. Here are some interesting properties. Is that if K and H are LO, this implies that G is LO. So left orderability is preserved under taking subgroups and is preserved under taking extensions. So that's great. Um, if K is LO and H is CO, this implies that G is CO. I mean, this is a lexicographic, this is what's called a lexicographic construction. So if this, this group over here, you can see my little mosquito there, this group over here is circularly orderable and this group over here is left orderable, it gives you circular orderability here. Right? And how does that work? How does that work? Right, is that, well, so let's have a look at H, right? H is a circularly orderable group, and let's say that here are the here are the elements of H in a circle, right? And then K is a left orderable group. Around each of these points, I just put a copy of K, and now each of these sort of intervals is a coset of K inside G. Right, so it's sort of you first, if you want to work out what the order of things are around a circle, you first have a look at where they are in H, and then if you need to distinguish them in H, you look at where they come from in K. Right, so it's a lexicographic circular, circular ordering. Brilliant. Now here's something else that's kind of interesting, is that um, the first fact about left orderability being preserved under extensions is not true for circular orderability. KCO and HCO does not imply that G is circularly orderable. Um, for example, right, just take the extension, this is as good as it gets. Just take that extension, right? We know that the only finite sub finite circularly orderable groups are cyclic. That thing in the middle is not cyclic. Okay. So this raises, um, so at this point, this is sort of all the background I wanted to give for this first part of the lecture. Um, and uh, let's gather up some of the interesting things that are going to motivate where the actual result comes from, um, motivate the next talk anyway, which is where all the meat is. Okay, so a couple of questions that come out of this very naturally. So let's write down the first one, which is the first one is super tantalizing. All right because it's a very basic question and we don't know the answer. Um, it's purely algebraic. If G and H are circularly orderable, if G and H are CO, when is G cross H circularly orderable? All right, this is a very basic question and we really don't know how to answer this. Um, yeah, anyway. Uh, and the, the other question, which is really the question that sort of started the whole project that I'm going to talk about in part two, um, it's a question of Katie Manns. Uh, 
Uh, so remember, left audible groups are torsion free, and circular audible groups can have torsion, right? But is that the only thing that stops them from being left audible? Right? So that I mean, this is I think this is a very natural question. It's a great question. So if um, if G is is circularly audible and torsion free, torsion free is G left audible. Okay, so that's going to face out of the way. Right? If G is circularly audible and torsion free, is G left audible? Okay. So um, this is where we're going to stop. So what's going to happen in part two is I'm going to I'm going to start off by reminding you about these questions, uh, the second one first, uh, and we're going to link everything to the L-space conjecture, and that's where a lot of our examples are going to come from. Uh, and what we're going to come up with, what we're going to see in part two, is a characterization of left orderability in terms of circular, starting with a circular orderable group, circularly orderable group characterization of when it's left orderable, which is a brand new one, and hopefully it'll be useful for um, proving something about the L-space conjecture. With a bit of luck. All right, that's it for now. Thanks for listening. See you next time.